Hello, my name is Kishwani. It's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the GRE, the third edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today is our lesson number 145. Day 3145. 3 is to signify the fact that we are in the third edition. Third edition, day 145. We are working on the practice test that you will find at the very end of the book on page number 365. Section 6. We'll begin with number 12. There are four problems on this page 12, 13, 14, and 15. And those are the four we're going to do today. Let's get going. As you can see, question number 12 is already on the blackboard. Make sure the book is in front of you. Turn to page number 360, 365 and read the problem to you, uh, to yourself rather. Uh, it says that we have a freight train and we have a passenger train. And these expressions will indicate the distances that these trains are. Distances are given by these two expressions t hours after 12 noon. t hours after 12 noon. In other words, if the value of t happens to be 1, then that's 1 p.m. If value happens to be 5, that's 5 p.m. So this is this 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 expression te tell you how far they are from Centerville, the distance from Centerville. The question simply is at what time at what time are they going to be equidistant? Since this expression indicates the distance, since this this since this expression indicates the distance train F is away from Centerville, and since this expression indicates the number of miles the train P is away from Centerville, P being the passenger train, F being the freight train. If we want them to be equidistant, of course, make them equal. So we have negative 10, negative 10T 10 plus 115 equals negative 20T plus 150. Let's bring our T's on one side. So let's add 22 to both sides. If we add 22 to both sides, we can get into this 20t here. We have a negative and a positive that will take care of that. And let's bring the 115 to the other side by subtracting 115 from both sides. Voila. Let's see what we can do. So this positive 115 and negative 115, that was the whole point. It goes away. And here we have a negative 10 and a positive 20. Negative 10 and a positive 20 will give us positive 10. So we have 10t now equals 150 minus 115. That will be... 5 and then 4 minus 1 is 3 and that's it 35 it is 35 I'm going to put it a little bit closer so when we do subtraction it comes out with 35 that's it we are done so divide both sides by 10 and t equals 3.5 3.5 here indicates 3.30 in the afternoon 3.30 p.m. 0.5 represents half an hour do you understand so at 3.30 in the afternoon they will they will be equidistant from the center wheel, regardless of which direction they are coming from, based on these two expressions. That's it, that's what we are done. 3.30 in the afternoon is the answer. If you are curious as to, so the answer here, what letter would the answer would be? Answer is B. If you are curious as to what was the percentile here, it was 49 percentile. About half the people got it right. That's it, as far as the problem is concerned, as far as the exam is concerned, we are done. But are you able to understand the the the, the graphs behind it? If you had to if you had to uh, if you had to display this uh, this phenomenon on the graph, would be able would we be able to do it? Let's let's try, it, shall we? Let's try. It. We don't need any of this. We just need the expressions. So what's going on here? What's going on here is let's erase this too because we have the expressions here. We have the two expressions here. We don't need that. On the x-axis, on the x-axis, we have the time measured in t, t being the hour after 12 noon. We don't need to keep repeating it. And what does the y-axis measure here? Y-axis measures distance, distance from Centerville. Let's, let's just simply call it d, d being the distance from Centerville. The first expression was this one, negative negative 110, negative 100, or rather negative 10t, negative 10t 
You understand? This is not necessary for the questions. We already finished with it. Plus one fifteen. Which one was it? Was it freight train or passenger train? It must have been freight train. It must have been freight train. How can I tell? How can we tell? But what does this represent? What does one fifteen represent? One fifteen is our intercept. Which intercept? Since this represents the distance, since this represents the distance from the center wheel, it must represent this intercept must represent the initial distance at twelve noon. This is where they start at twelve noon. At twelve noon is where the story begins. And at twelve noon, this is the freight train. This is the freight train. And I'll tell you in a second how we know it's a freight train. At, at 12 noon, the freight train was 115 miles, 115 miles from the center wheel. At the same time, the passenger train, passenger train was negative 20 t plus 150. Apparently, passenger train started out a little bit farther away, a little bit farther away. F A R, farther away, not further away. Do you understand? People who do not know any better, they will say a little bit further away. It's not a little bit further away. Further simply means additional. Far, farther, farthest. So apparently, passenger train started by a little bit farther away at a distance of 150. At a distance of 150. But, but passenger train, the slope is negative 20, which means that every one hour, it reduces the distance from where it is to the center wheel. Right here, eventually, we're going to hit the center wheel. Eventually, we're going to hit the center wheel, or rather, right here, the center. This is the distance. This in here is going to become zero on the x-axis right here. Eventually, when it cuts it, when it reaches here, that's the this vertical distance is the distance from the center wheel. It will reach center wheel when it reaches x-axis. It's going at 20 miles an hour. Every hour, it reduces it, it 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 reduces the distance between itself and its destination, the center wheel, by 20 miles. Let's do that. So this has a this has a little bit of bigger slope. This is a passenger train, and this guy has a little bit of flatter slope. It has a slope of only 10. Its speed is 10 miles an hour. That's how I knew, because it's only 10 miles an hour. This is 20 miles an hour. I just assume the freight train is going a little bit slower. It's 10 miles an hour. It's a little, little bit flatter, right here. This is, the, this is the freight train. And this is the point where they are exactly the same distance from their destination, whatever this distance happens to be. That happens, that happens right here at 3.30 in the afternoon. After three and a half hours, the, after they've been going for three and a half hours, it happens there. And since we know it's three and a half an hour, again, all of this is not necessary. I know I keep repeating myself. We can very quickly figure out what this point here is. It's very quickly, it's very easy. At three and a half hours, at three and a half hours, passenger train, because it's going 10 miles an hour, will go 35 miles. And, and rather freight train, and because this thing is going 20 miles an hour, in three and a half hours it will go 70 miles. Well, it started out, it started out at 150. It started out at 150, it goes 70 miles, which means this distance must be 80. From here to here, they are 80 miles away. Let's see if it fits with the other one. This, this thing is, it goes for 35 miles in three and a half hour because it's going 10 miles an hour. It started out 115 miles away. 115, 115 minus 35, 0, 11 minus 3 is 80, you see, 80, and 80, right here. So after they have both been going for three and a half miles, or rather, three and a half hours, after both the passenger train and the freight train had been going for three and a half hours, starting from 12 noon exactly, now they are both exactly 80 miles away from the center wheel. As I said, what directions they're coming from doesn't matter. They started at 12 noon, freight train was going at 10 miles an hour, it's, and when it started, the freight train was 115 miles away from its destination. And destination, I keep pointing here, it's actually here. This, when, they, when they reach zero, they are at Centerville. Because vertical, dis, vertical axis measures the distance from Centerville. When they keep, and every, every, every hour it, it goes, keeps going down, and eventually when it reaches the x-axis, they're at the destination. So, freight train started at 12 noon, it was 115 miles away at that point. Passenger train started at 12 noon also, but it started 150 miles away. But passenger train was going twice the speed of the freight train. And turns out that exactly three and a half hours later, they are at the, they are equidistant from the center wheel. They are, they are same distance from the center wheel, exactly 80 miles apart, 80 miles away from their destination. 
which means freight train will, freight train will arrive at its destination eight hours from now and passenger train will arrive in four hours from now because passenger train is going 20 miles an hour. Enough of that. All that time that we spend, more than half the time on this question, is not something we need to do in the real exam, as I already said it two or three times. Let's do the next one. Question number 13. In question number 13, we have 80 employees, we are told, and each has, each has a different salary. That is important here. Each, each has different salary. In other words, we do not have two or three people, all, uh, all, all two, two or three people earning $48,000. No, they each have dis different salaries. Even if it's a difference of just one cent, but it's a unique salary. Everybody has a distinct amount of salary. We are told Mark's salary, Mark's salary of $43,700 is the second highest, is the second highest in the first quartile. All of this is very important bits of information. Do you understand? We cannot ignore any of this thing. It's not there just for fun. Then we are told that eight new employees were hired. Eight new employees were hired. And turns out all of them all of them started out, started with salaries lower than the current lowest. That is also very important. We hired eight new people and the people who are the most junior, the newest people, all of them had the salary which was lower than what we were paying right now, what we are paying currently to our lowest guy. Do you understand? We have to keep all of that in mind. Sim question simply is this. Question simply is, what would Mark's salary B, in terms of ranking, you understand? I'm not writing everything down. How does he rank now? Before, we know he was the second highest in the first quartile. But what happens now? We hired eight new people. All of them had salary lower than the current lowest. Where does Mark fall now in, his, in the ranking? Should we find out? Let's find out. It has to do with quartile, obviously, because that's what they're fussing about. They're fussing about quartile. They want to see if we understand our quartiles. Let's find out. We leave the room. Instead of doing everything at the body bottom, we're going to start at the top. Let's erase everything. One more time, very quickly. We have 80 employees. Each of them, every one of them has a different salary. Mark's salary is 43,700. It's the second highest in the first quartile. What he's earning is not important. What is important here is that we have to understand that at, at present, he is the second highest in the first quartile. We must remember it. He is the second highest in the first quartile. Eight new employees are hired. They were paid salaries that were lower than the lowest current salary right now. The question is, where does Mark fall in the ranking? So let's do our quarter. We have 80 employees. So 20, 40, 60, and 80. That doesn't look very even, does it? This looks like about the midpoint. This looks like the midpoint of that, and that looks like the midpoint of that. There you go. Okay. So, here is the 20th guy. Here is the 40th guy. Here is the 60th guy. And there is the 80th guy. These are our four quartiles. Where does Mark start out? Mark was the second highest in the first quartile. Mark was. Mark was. That's the operative word. He was. Not anymore. After we hired eight new people, his ranking has changed, obviously. But he was second highest in the first quartile. Well, where is first quartile? First quartile ends here. In other words, 20th guy, 20th guy in the ranking, after their ranking had been arranged from the least to the greatest, 
the guy who's making the 20 highest salary is the end of our first quarter. This is the end of our first quarter. Mark is not the highest. 20th guy represents the highest salary in the first quarter. Highest. 20th represents the highest salary in the first quarter. Quarter one. And if you know the sell, if you knew the salary of the 20th guy, and if you knew the salary of the 21st guy, we'll take the average of the two, and that will be that would have been, that should be obviously, and that that is the demarcation for the first quartile and second quartile. But we don't worry about that one. What we need to understand here is the 20th guy is the highest salary in the first quartile. Mark was the second highest, which means Mark was here, right here was Mark. Mark was here. This is our guy. He's he was the 19th. He was the 19th. He had the 19th highest salary in the firm, making him the second highest in the first quarter. You with me so far? Okay. Let's introduce the eight new employees. Let's introduce the eight new employees and let's see what happens. Again, very quickly. So again, our quartiles. If the line does not come out straight, it's not a big deal, is it? Besides, it's never going to come out perfectly straight for two reasons. First of all, because I'm doing it by hand. And secondly, this, this blackboard is slippery. We'll worry about these two words later, okay? So let, let's go very quickly. So. Here is the first quartile now, but now the first quartile would end at the 22nd highest salary. The second quartile will end at the 44th highest salary. The third quartile will end at the 66th highest salary. And the last one, the person who has the 88th highest salary in the ranking is the highest salary overall because there are only 88 people. Are you with me so far? All right. So let's, talk, let's understand what's going on here. So from here, from the, this, this, this marker represents the lowest salary in the firm, from the lowest salary. And this mark can represent the 22nd salary. And in these 22 people, in these 22 people, we have eight people who were hired just now. We have eight people who were hired just now. 22 minus eight is 14. 22 minus eight is 14. What does that say? What does 14 represent? 14th represent this guy right here. The guy who used to be 14th, you can understand it, the guy who used to be 14th here, the guy whose salary was the 14th highest. Okay, let's understand it together. The guy whose salary was the 14th highest before these eight people were higher, all of a sudden he finds, he goes around proudly telling everybody, hey, look at me, I am the highest paid guy in the first quartile even though his salary has not changed. His salary has not changed. What has changed as a result of eight people having been hired is the ranking of the salary. Because the first eight, if you start out here, one, two, three, four, first eight people, they are, they are the newest hired people and they have the lowest salary. So here in this ranking, what, what the guy who was 14th, all of a sudden gets pushed over to 22nd. Because 22nd person is the same as the 14th person. Because you see, if you subtract 8 from the 22 people, there are 22 people in this quartile. If you subtract 8 from me, you get 14. That's this guy. Where is our guy? What happens to this guy? Any idea? Well, he was the 19th guy before. He was the 19th guy before, but now there are 8 more people. Which means he is 27th guy. He is the 27th guy. Let's find out where the very fault, shall we? This is 22nd guy. He's the 22nd guy. 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th. Aha, this is where our guy is. We found him. Yeah, we found him. Yes. We found our guy. That's our guy. Except now, his salary is not the 19th highest in, in the firm. His salary is 27th highest in the firm because eight new people were hired. That's it, we're done. So where does it rank? Where do you think it ranks? Let's find out, shall we? Okay. 
One, two, three, four, five. There you go. This this point represents the end of the first quartile. Because technically, it's the average of the 22nd and the 23rd guy. Somewhere right in the middle is would be the average. That will be the demarcation. That will be the demarcation. So the second second quartile actually begins not here, not here. It begins at the average of the two, right here. It begins the second quartile. If you knew the salary of the 22nd guy, if you knew the high salary of the 23rd guy, you would take the average of the two, and that would be the demarcation. Our guy is here. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five. Aha! Now he is the fifth highest person in the second quartile. Now our guy, now our guy is the fifth highest paid worker, fifth highest in the second quartile. So he may feel bad psychologically because he's only the fifth highest because before he was the second highest in the first quartile. But being second highest in the first quartile in the original situation and being the fifth highest in the second quartile, his salary has not changed. It's just a ranking because we hired eight new people. That's it. That's the answer. The answer is our guy is the fifth highest in the second quartile. What answer choice is that? Let's quickly take a look at it. Number 13. The fifth. Well, they said the fifth lowest. Yes, technically it is the fifth lowest. It's not the fifth highest. Sorry, fifth highest would have been from here. This, this, this is this is the lowest salary in the second quartile. One, two, three. I hope they do not have. I hope and pray to God. I'm going to take a look at it just to save my diary, just to make sure that I hope they do not have another choice which says the fifth highest. Because if they do, I would have ended up picking that one because I wasn't paying attention. So the first one said the fourth highest. No. Second one says the highest salary. No. Second lowest. No. And the third lowest, no. Lucky for us, they do not use, they do not have a second answer choice, which also says fifth highest. It's not the fifth highest, it is actually the fifth lowest. And as you can see, we are starting from here, not from that end. And that is answer choice E. I'm glad that we checked. And that's answer choice E. What is it? Oh, no kidding. No kidding. Just about. Just about a quarter of the people who took the exam got it right. Almost three quarter, almost three quarter missed it. As you can see, it's 27 percent. Let's move on, shall we? We still have two more to go. And at this pace, if we keep going at a leisurely pace, I'm afraid that by the time we finish, cows may actually arrive home. We do not want them to arrive. We want to finish before the cows come home. Number 14. And for those of you who do not know that expression, Google it and learn it. Do you understand? Cows come home. I'm going to speed up because as I look out the window, I can see the cows approaching. Number 14. We have a point we are told, negative 6 and 7, which we are told is the center of a circle. Of a, see, uh, there's no point in rushing too much. If I rush too much, my handwriting just becomes atrocious. Or I have to be more precise, more atrocious than usual is what I meant to say. To, to claim that they be, my handwriting becomes atrocious would be giving too much credit to myself. It becomes more atrocious. God only knows it is already quite unseemly. We never learned this word. We are further told that point, point negative six and five lies inside the circle. And we are told that the point positive eight and negative seven lies outside. The question simply is, what's its radius? And we are told that whatever the radius is, whatever the radius is of this guy, of this circle, we are told it's a whole number, it's an integer. You understand? First thing first, in, throughout the entire problem, I'm going to use letter R to represent the radius. They want to be cute, 
and they want to use letter M for radius just to throw you off because typically we use letter M traditionally convention dictates that we use letter M to represent the slope of a line don't fuss about it it's just a symbol I do not know why they want to use M well actually I do know why, I, why they want to use the word M I just told you they want to be cute they want to be pain pain in the derriere it is up to you whether or not you will allow it to happen just ignore it just use letter R because that's, I have a habit of using R for radius. If I don't tell you right now, because I'm going to keep switching back and forth, it's going to cause confusion. We will be done with all of this thing. Oh, before I erase these, just give me one quick second. If you're interested in learning uh, uh, or improving your vocabulary, I'll tell you where to go. Because simply working on the math portion is not enough. You must also work on the other half of the exam, which is the verbal portion. And for that, decent vocabulary is a must. You must learn the words that appear on a regular basis on the JRE. Demarcate we learn on day number 12. Misnomer. What's the misnomer? A misnomer is a wrong label. A label that is not correct because I just referred to this bloody thing as a black, as, as a blackboard. It's not a blackboard as you can tell it. See it's a whiteboard but I don't like saying whiteboard because I grew up calling it blackboard back in the old days in the in the previous century. You understand? Yes it is previous it was previous century. Uh, misnomer. I know we learned it. Just give me one second. If it takes too long, I'm just going to give it a miss. No, I can't find it. I know we did learn it, but I don't know which day. I can't find it right now. We may have learned unseemly as well. Who knows? And you will not take very long because there aren't too many words starting with you. So I'm going to check. We have unsatiable, underscore, ulterior, utilitarian, urbane, upshot, unwittingly, unbeknownst, and usage. No, we did not learn this word at all. This word we did not learn. So if you're interested in improving your vocabulary, just, just search and put in the search box, in the search box, GRE vocabulary words. That's all you have to put in. GRE vocabulary words, day 12. Watch the video where we learned the word demarcate. We did learn the word misnomer, I don't know which day. And unsimply, I have not covered. As a matter of fact, before I forget it, why don't I make a note of it here, under you, to cover it in the future. All right. Let's continue. So let's draw a circle, shall we? Let's draw a circle. This is inside, and this is outside. I want you to do up here. So, center is negative 6 and 7. Negative 6 and 7. 2, 4, 6, negative 6, and positive 7. Really? Positive 7, negative 6. Oh, negative 6 is the x coordinate. What the hell? 2, 4, 6, negative 6, and positive 7. Hmm. 2, 4, 6, 8. This is 8, so this is 7. I think it's not positive 7 because my, my, my picture in my nose is negative 7. The center is negative 6 and negative 7. Negative 6 and negative 7. So this is negative 6. It's negative 2. Negative 4, negative 6, and negative 7 would be 2, 4, 6. This is negative 6, this is negative 8, negative 7 is here. There we go. Now it looks like what I have. That's our center. Let's make a note here. That's the center. Negative 5, negative 6, and 5. Negative 6 and 5. This is what we have to do. Otherwise, you're going to get it wrong. If you try to take shortcuts, you're going to get it wrong. You just stay calm. It takes time, but this is the only way. Negative 6 and 5. Negative 6 and 5. Negative 6 is right here and 5. 2, 4, 6. 5 is going to be right here. Negative 6 and positive 5. Negative 6 and positive 5 should be way up here. Yes, negative 6 and positive 5 is not. This is not even negative 6. I'm sorry. I'm just going to... I'm just going to take a deep breath, just give me a break. A break.
Okay, I'm not gonna rush. There's no point. If you rush, if you try to do it faster, it takes longer. So negative six and negative seven is right here. I'm gonna rewrite it properly so we can read it. The center is negative six and negative seven. Negative six and negative seven. Right here is the center, that part is correct. We are told that point negative six and five. Negative six is right here, negative six and five. Two, four, six, the five is right here. There we go. We first look, we located this point. Let's call it point A. Let's call it point A, and we are told, we are told that point A is inside. We are told that point A is inside the circle. Well, what does it tell us? Point A, right here, negative six and five, is inside. Is inside the circle. What is the distance from point C to point A? Well, from here to here is 7. This distance is 7 and this distance is 5. 7 plus 5 is 12 and that point lies within the circle. This is the center. If C is the center and point A lies within the, within the circle, then point A, then point A implies that the radius of the circle, whatever it is, is is more than 12. 7 plus 5 is 12, because so that point is inside the circle. We are done with that. Let's look at point B. Point B, we're going to call this one point B, which is outside. Let's look at it properly. Positive 8 and negative 7. Positive 8, 2, 4, 6, positive 8, and negative 7. Negative 7 is right here. That's point B, positive 8 and negative 7, and that we are told, that we are told lies outside. Let's find out how far it is from C to B. From C to the axis here, because it was positive 5, this one was positive 5, the center was negative 7 and positive 5, or rather negative 5. The center was negative 6. The center was negative 6 and negative 7. Right here is the center, right right here. Negative 6, which means from this line, from this line, from here to the y-axis is 6. And this one goes all the way up to 8. This one goes all the way up to 8, which means this distance is 8. 8 plus 6 is 14. And that point, point B, lies outside. If it lies outside, then point B implies that the radius, whatever it is, is got to be less than 14. Because point B, which is 14 units from point C, which is the center, lies outside. By the time you get to point B, we're already outside the circle. The distance of 14 represents greater distance than the, than the length of the radius. A distance of 12 represents a distance that is within the circle. Well, if radius is greater than 12 and it is less than 14 and we are further told that radius has to be has to be an integer, a whole number, well it has to be an integer, it has to be an integer, it's more than 12, less than 14, well there you go, radius must be exactly 13. Radius would have to be 13. Again, the percentile. 38 percent, almost almost three-fifths of the people, a little bit more than three-fifths, more than 60 percent, missed it. Let's do number 15. That, would, that one is take a while. Let's do number 15. This video is going to be very long, but I told myself that we're going to do all of them, the entire page, in one shot. Let's do 15. It's going to be a very long video. We are told, so we are told that negative m over 19 is an even integer. Negative m over 19 is an even integer. We don't need, we don't need any of this anymore. What it simply is. Which of the which of the following is 
my three true. The first statement says m is negative. Pay attention to details, pay attention to the wordings. The most important word here, can you tell me which, which, which one is the most important word in this question? Just one word? Just one word. The most important word in this question is right here. I underscored it and I put it in capital letter. Which of the following must be true? Not may be true. There are a lot of things that they might say that may or may not be true. But we're looking for something that has to be true, that has to be necessarily true, that must be true, that has to be true all the time based on what we are told here. So let's get going, shall we? We are told that this quantity, m over 19, m over 19, negative, negative of m over 19, we are told, is an integer. Not only it's an integer, not only it's a whole number, but it has to be even. What can we do? Well, the first thing we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is to cut, cut the string. It is always a good idea not to be a puppet in the exam. If they tell you that uh, it's, not, it's a small point, it's not a big thing what I'm about to say, it's not earth shattering, but if they tell you that let's, let, let the radius be M, and if you find it annoying to call the radius bloody M, then don't call it M, call it R. Cut the string, don't be a puppet. Do not be a puppet. Don't dance to their tune, just cut the string, be independent. Okay? It doesn't matter whether it's 19 or 9, it's not going to make any difference. It's not going to make any difference. 19 does not have any significance here. It will make our work simpler. So negative m over 9, negative of m over 9, we are told, is an even integer. What can we plug in for m? What can we plug in here? It says m is negative. m is negative. Let's, let's see what happens here. Can we, can we make m positive 18? Can we make m positive 18? Well, if m happens to be positive 18, positive 18 divided by 9 gives us negative 2. And even though it is negative, even though it is negative, this is where probably people, people uh, trip off, even though it's a negative number, but it is an even integer. Negative 2 is an even integer. So it's negative 4 and so is negative 6 and negative 8 and all of them. All the even numbers that are positive, if you could stick a negative sign in front of them, they are still the even numbers. It doesn't change the fact if 384 is even number, then so is negative 384. There we go. We found situations where we have an even number. M, M, M divided by 9 is an, is an even integer. It's an even integer. But M is not negative. We, posit, we put in positive 18. We put in positive 18. Now the only difference would have been instead of 9, instead of 9 if we had used 19, then instead of 18, we would have used 2 times 19. 2 times 19, 2 times 20 is 40, it would have been 38. We, we would have plugged in 38. 38, 38 divided by, at, at the bottom I meant, at the bottom we would have had 38. At, at, at the top we would have 38 and the bottom we would have had 19. If we had, if I, if we had used the original number that is given in the problem, instead of changing it, if we, if we had worked with 19, then instead of putting in 18 on the top, we would have plugged in 38. As you can see, it's a positive number. Positive number divided by 19, ends up with negative 2, which is still an even integer, but m is not necessarily negative. We have positive m. We just prove that even when m is positive, even when m is positive, it is quite possible, it is quite possible that we end up, the result of this quantity, m over ne negative, negative of m over 9, it is possible to arrive at an even integer. So to claim that m must be negative is wrong. It's a wrong claim. M does not need to be negative because we just plug in positive number. So I'm going to switch back to I'm going to switch back to our nine. You understand? I'm going to switch back to our nine. Forget about nineteen. So statement one is not true. Uh, we shouldn't say statement one is not true. That to say that statement one is not true actually is wrong claim. What we should say is that statement one is not necessarily true. It may be true, but not necessarily so. And we're looking for something that has to be true all the time. Let's look at statement two. Too much, too much talk. Statement B says m is m is positive. M is a positive integer. M is a positive integer. Again, same thing. M over nine. M over nine minus negative of m over nine. What if m happens to be negative eighteen? 
If m happens to be negative 18, negative of negative of negative 18 divided by divided by 9 will end in a negative of negative 2, which will end up in positive 2, and positive 2 is an even, even integer. So again, we arrived at an even integer, but as you can clearly see, m is doesn't have to be positive. M does not necessarily need to be positive. Here we have M that is negative. Even though M is negative, we arrive at a, at a result which is an even integer. Which means second statement does not need to be true. Does not need to be true. It may be true. It doesn't have to be. It is not something that must be true. Third statement. Statement C. The statement C says the statement C says M is a prime number. M is a prime number. Now here they are trying to trip us off. Listen carefully. They try to trick us because originally what is given in the problem is M over 19. M over 19 which we changed to 9. So I'm going to show you both ways what happens. Let's, let's, start, let's pretend it's 9. Let's just start with that. It says M is a prime number. If M is a prime number then what we have is what we have here is a prime number divided by an odd number prime number divided by odd number will never will never result in an even number it's impossible because if the result is an even number then the top guy has to be at least two times the bottom number and if it's two times the bottom number the only thing that we have here, the only only prime number that is two times something is two itself, and two two is not a two times bottom number, because bottom is nine. So the lowest number that we have that is two times, in order for us to get a even even quantity out of this one, the lowest value that m can take is eighteen. If we're working with nine, eighteen divided by nine will give us an even quantity as we saw a little while ago, but that is not a prime number. If you divide a prime number by odd number you will never result in an even number. Now let's work with what is given to us originally. It is actually given to us, what is given to us actually is 19, which makes the situation even worse. A prime number divided by a prime number cannot possibly end in a 2, or 4, or 6, or 8. How can it possibly end in a 2, an even number, and for it to be end in a 2, again the same argument, if this for this to for this quantity to end to end in a two, the top quantity would have to be two times the bottom quantity. Well, if it's two times something, it's an even number. An even number cannot be a prime number. The only exception is two. Other than that, there are no even numbers which are two times some quantity. Because if they are two times some quantity, they are even. And if it's even, it cannot be prime by definition. The only exception is, of course, the very first prime number, which is two. It is, not, it is not possible. To, it is impossible to divide a prime number by another prime number and arrive at an even number. It will never result in an even number. That is wrong. I'm trying to wrap it up because I feel like I've been here forever. Statement D says, Statement D says, M is odd. M is odd. Let's do it separately. Let's do it separately. First of all, we know that m does not need to be odd because here we plugged in 18, which is the even number. Here we plugged in 18 and it worked. When we plugged in 18, positive 18, it worked. We arrived at, a, at an even number, even integer. When we plugged in negative 18, we arrived at an e even integer. m does not need to be odd. Uh, m does not need to be odd. We have even here. m does not need to be odd, but the question is, Simply saying that M does not need to be odd is a very weak statement. Let's answer the question, can M ever be odd in this situation? Let's do it separately. We need the room, so I'm going to erase this part. Let's erase, let's erase this thing. Let's under, remember, C does not work. D says M is odd. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. If M is odd, we have negative M over 19, don't we? I'm back to 19 again. 19 or 9 doesn't matter. As I already told you several times, it makes no difference. If M is odd, then what we end up here is odd over odd. Can odd over odd end in an even? The answer is no. Answer is no for this reason. We know even times even is even. Even times odd times odd. 
you should know these things. If you multiply an odd number by an odd number, 3 times 5 is 15, you're going to end up in an odd number. But what happens if we, if we multiply even times odd, even times odd, for example, 4 times 3 is 12, you're going to end up in an even. Similarly, odd times even, you're going to end up in an even. When we multiply odd number by an even number, odd number by an even number, you end up with an even number. Just give me one second. M is an odd number. No, that argument is not going to work actually. I'm wrong. I'm wrong here. Because here, if we cross multiply, if we cross multiply, I made it far too complicated than it needed to be. If we cross multiply, we end up with odd times even. Oh, I see. If we cross multiply, odd times even, odd times even is even. It has to be even. And right here, odd times even has to be even. When we multiply odd times even, it has to be even. But in this equation, if you divide odd number by odd number, it tells that we're going to get an even quantity. We have to get an even quantity. It is impossible. It is impossible to divide two odd numbers and get an even number. Because if you cross multiply, odd times even is even. Odd times even cannot be odd times even cannot be odd, which is what this is saying. So I was right. This, this, this thing does not work. It does not work for this sophisticated reason or for some very simple reason because M says, it says M is odd. Well, M is not odd. We already plugged in uh, 18 twice and it worked. It's not. Let's look at E. There you go. It says, it says M is an even integer. M is an even integer. And the answer is yes. That is something, that is something that has to be true. M has to be even. Why? Because we have negative M over 19. First of all, this negative plays no role. It is just for, for those, that negative in the front is just to catch those people who do not realize that negative 10 is actually even. Even though it's negative, it is even. That's the only reason why it's there to throw you off. So it really plays no role. The fact that it's 19 also does not play the role. What matters here is that it says M is an even integer. If M is even, if M is even, and if bottom number is odd, which 9 is or 19 is, Will it result in even? And the answer is yes, it will result in even because if you cross multiply, what you end up here is that r times even, r times even, and r times even of course is even. Right here. r times even is even. So that is always true. The top number would have to be an even number. That's the only way when we divide it by 19 or 9 or something, we're going to get an even quantity. Because if the bottom is 9, the bottom is 9, the lowest number that we need on the top is 2 times 9 or 4 times 9, or 8 times 9. If bottom number is 19, you just need 2 times 19. But the fact that it's 2 times 19 or 4 times 19, which means top number is even. So top number is even. That is something that has to be true. So what do we conclude? We conclude that A does not work. We concluded that A does not work, B does not work, C does not work, D does not work, only E. Only E works. Only E works, and here the percentile was 40%. Three-fifths of the people missed it. Now I'm going to go over in the back of the camera. I don't have the ability to actually look at the time, and I don't look at the clock when I start, so I have no idea how long this video has been. I'm going to go in the back of the camera and see how long it is. It is pretty long. I hope I did not bore the pants off you. I hope that at this point as I speak, towards the very end of this video, you're not watching it all natural. So that would not be very nice. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.